Good morning, and welcome to Overizel Reformed Church. I have one quick note before we start our service from Jill. Um, she wants you to know that they are still in need of a few more volunteers for Sunday school and Wednesday nights. So if you're open and interested in doing that, see her after the service. She'll be out by the sign-up board. And then also, if you are an adult Sunday school leader, she'd like to connect with you at some point today, just to make sure we're all on the same base. So. The good news is that our God is present here with us this morning through His Spirit. And He welcomes us here this morning with familiar words. So let's stand and receive His welcome. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning we have the opportunity to proclaim our voluntary acceptance of God's will for our lives through the first song this morning. We proclaim that we will follow him wherever he leads us. So let's sing together. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. seated. At this time, I welcome Lauren down to share with us about how this plays out in life, how we follow our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't know me, I think pretty much everyone does, but my name is Lauren Brower, longtime member of Over Isle. And um, it was about a year and I think three weeks ago that myself and a bunch of helpers from Over Isle and other churches sent a container 
to Mozambique, Africa. Um, it was a container full of medical supplies, hospice kits, um, and a lot of farming equipment. And it went to the area where Chad Van and Bosch is working um, to help develop a farm, a farm that now has been in operation for three years. The main objective of that farm is um, to be an institute to train people how to grow their own food, how to begin the farming process to sell food. And um, many people have gone through the program and it's, it's been a huge blessing to the area. Um, the cargo that we sent has all been used, even the cardboard boxes for the most part, they've been able to utilize. Um, and since then, they have asked me if I would be on something like a board, it's not really a board, but a group of people that are helping to give Chad support and information, help him make decisions about that farm. And in the last three months, we've come to the realization that the farm is growing way more than we ever anticipated it to be. We, we started it as a testing process to see if we could make it work, to see if it's what the area needed, to see if it could help people. And it's gone way beyond that. Um, and it's fulfilled a need to feed people, but not just to feed people, but to gain trust in those people, to open their hearts to the Word of God. Um, in ways that are almost impossible otherwise. And so we have reached a point where we have hit limitations as to how far we can go um, with what we have over there. And so about two months ago, we began, we began talking about putting together another container. As of last week, that has become um, something we are going to do. So we've had one quite major donation. Um, most of that is gonna go to buy a tractor again. Uh, the Kubota we sent a little over a year ago is being worked to death, quite literally. Um, for those of you that follow Chad, um, on like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you'll, you'll see that and he talks about it frequently. Uh, we just picked up three more acres over there in a lot better location. The ground is poor, but it's in a location where more people can see, um, where we can do a lot more outreach. And uh, the tractor we're, we're looking at picking up, we're gonna buy it over there. It saves us a lot of money. We don't have to transport it. Um, and it's a lot bigger tractor, 50 or 55 horse tractor. Um, right now, I have not distributed list of equipment that we're looking for. The reason for that is I need to get together enough money to solidify the cost of shipping the container, which is about $25,000. Uh, we have about 10,000 of that right now. So, if God puts that on your heart, that you would like to contribute to that, that would be great. If you know of business partners that I should be talking to, please let me know. Um, and I w because I'd like to do that. The object is to fill the container again. Um, we also have our Vox missionary. I don't know where Brent is. What's his name, Brent? It was just in the bulletin this morning. Eric Dreyer, thank you. Yeah, so he's right down the road um, from Chad. So we do have an opportunity to get him supplies uh, if we have room in the container too, which is great. So um, right now, I know I don't have a ton of information for you, but I don't want to start collecting donations as far as equipment or medical supplies, that kind of thing, until I have the actual shipping money solidified because otherwise I end up with a whole bunch of stuff that I can't go anywhere with. 
So um, my name is in the, in the uh, directory. Feel free to call me, email me if you know of people or if you're interested. One thing I do want to say is I don't want this to take money away from any other missionaries that are currently supported. That is so important to me. Um, this church supports a wide variety of missionaries that do incredible work. Um, this farm is very passionate to me, and so this is the one I'm involved in. But I don't want to take money from those other missionaries. And even Chad, if you normally give to the offering plate of Chad, don't withhold that for this program because Chad requires those monies for his day-to-day -day living. This is a special thing. So look at it that way. Um, but we do need help. We need help from anybody that is willing. And people, lives are being saved over there, both physically and spiritually because of this farm. The, the outreach of this farm is significantly larger in reaching way more people than we ever expected it would. Um, I hope that, that uh, most of you are currently following what Chad does on Facebook or, or Instagram or YouTube. If you don't, um, I will talk to our secretaries and see if we can get those published um, in, in the uh, bulletin. And then once I get a paper out um, that says what, what type of things we're looking for, it'll all be on there too. But so you can follow and see what work is really being done in Mozambique, Africa. So if you have any questions or any comments, after church, look me up. I'll hang out for a while, probably outside on the west side. Um, thank you very much for your time. What a beautiful opportunity to do exactly what we're about to sing about. We're going to sing two songs that talk about being ac active in engaging this world with acts of justice. So let's stand together as we sing, Living for Jesus and Let Your Heart Be Broken.
You can be seated. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we dive into your word this morning, we pray that you will speak to us through Scripture. We pray that through your Holy Spirit, we will understand what is being said, and that as is needed, you will convict us so that we go from this place living as you have called us to. We pray that all temptations and distractions will cease as we engage with you so that we may focus on who you are and who you have called us to be. It is in the powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This morning will be the third time that I've had the opportunity to preach over the course of this summer. And we're going to continue in the progression that we have already established. The first time I spoke, we talked about Jacob as he takes his family and he heads down into Egypt. Last time I spoke, we learned about Moses being placed in the Nile as a baby and then rescued and growing up in Pharaoh's house. This morning, we're going to continue in that right where we left off last time. As we look at Moses, who is now an adult, we're going to look at three different stories in our passage where Moses addresses something very important to us as the people of God. And we learn that this characteristic defines who Moses is. It's this characteristic of justice. Now, when I say the word justice this morning, some of you might have had this little twitch or a cringe because our, our society right now is very focused on social justice. And so before we enter into our passage this morning, I'd like to take a moment to pause and to understand and establish what it is that I'm actually talking about as we look at a biblical concept of justice. To do this, I have a short video for us to watch. Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that, but we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. They covered a lot in that two-minute video. So a brief recap of what we're looking at when we say biblical justice. We're looking at a type of justice that seeks to provide restoration, salvation, and redemption for those who are being oppressed. As the video said, it's this concept of radically living out Christ's call for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. So with that in mind, 
I invite you to join me as I read through our passage this morning. And I invite you to try to see how Moses is living this out. Our passage is Exodus 2, verse 11 through 22. You can follow along on the screen or in your own Bibles. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you've come home so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Our story this morning starts out with a relatively simple plot. It's something you almost would anticipate seeing in a children's book. It just simply sets up and addresses what's to come in this story. It says, when Moses had grown up, he went out. And yet we find that in these words, the writer of Exodus, who we actually believed to be Moses, is really addressing who he's going to become. You see, in the prior 40 years of his life, Moses had grown up in the house of Pharaoh, as an Egyptian. He learned to talk like an Egyptian, to walk like an Egyptian, and to look like an Egyptian. Even to the point where the seven daughters thought he was an Egyptian. But in the first verse of our passage, Moses is very intentional about letting us know that he does not consider himself to be an Egyptian, but rather a Hebrew. We find this in the two instances where he refers to the Hebrew people as his people. And it's because of this identification that our story's plot begins to develop. It thickens. It gets a little bit more exciting. Because behold, he goes out for the first time to see his own people. And he sees their affliction. And behold, before him, an Egyptian is beating a Hebrew. It's at this point in his life where he has to make a decision about who he is going to be. Is he going to identify himself with the people of God? Or is he going to continue to be an Egyptian? When I was younger, quite a bit younger, I spent a season on a Little League baseball team. I wasn't very good, so I only spent one season on the baseball team. And when I went up to bat, it was a pretty good chance I was going to strike out. But every once in a while, I'd get lucky and they'd walk me. And I'd end up on base. And I was actually pretty fast, so I, I got pretty good at stealing bases. But every once in a while, I'd find myself in what they call a pickle. 
It's not a very fun place to be. You're stuck between this space and this space. The other team is on both sides, and they're tossing the ball back and forth, almost just playing a game of catch as they slowly move towards you to tag you out. I learned very quickly that first, I didn't want to be in a pickle, and second, when I found myself in that situation, it was far better just to choose a base to try to get to and probably get tagged out than to run back and forth, floundering hopelessly, not knowing where to go. Moses in this story is in a very similar situation. He finds himself in a pickle because for the first time in his life, he has to choose who he's going to be. If he chooses to be an Egyptian, then he will let this Hebrew continue to be beaten, potentially beaten to death. But he'll maintain his status and his wealth and his comfortable life. But if he identifies himself with the people of God, then he has to insert himself into this situation. He has to address the injustice that is happening. And he has to bring about salvation for that individual at the risk of losing everything he has. We find that Moses decides to identify himself as one of the people of God, and he inserts himself into the situation. And that teaches us our, our first lesson for this morning. It's this concept that we, as the people of God, should define ourselves by acts of justice. Not just when it's convenient, but when it could cost us everything. As our story continues, we learn that it really does cost Moses everything. Because as he goes out the next day, behold, there's not just injustice from the Egyptians, but there's an internal injustice that is taking place for the Hebrews. Because he sees in the street two Hebrews who are having this physical altercation. But as someone who identifies himself as someone who pursues justice, he chooses not to just continue on, but to try to bring about restoration in that relationship. And it's here that we learn the second and the more difficult lesson of our story this morning. It's that when we try to insert ourselves into instances of injustice, it's not always welcomed. Sometimes, the people who we are trying to help don't want our help. But as we learn from the story, that's not an excuse to stop trying to give the help. I believe that the song that the Beatles sing uses words that describe it quite well, the, the pride of an individual. They say, when I was younger, so much younger than today, I wouldn't take anybody's help in any way. But the idea and the hope is that eventually an individual will come to a point of accepting the help that we offer. As the Beatles song continues, now these days are gone and I'm not so self-assured. I find I've changed my mind. I've opened up the doors. Help me if you can. And so, as we offer help, whether it's accepted or not, we are compelled as the people of God to be people who pursue justice. Well, sadly, this morning, our, our story, it doesn't show us that instance where the help is accepted from Moses, but rather the individual, almost with a snarky tone, gives this nice little jeer at Moses. He says, who are you to offer me assistance to try to bring justice to this situation? Because didn't you kill someone yesterday? Oh yes, the secret is out. I know what you did. You know better than I am. It's at this moment that Moses realizes that his secret is out. He tried to bring restoration to a prior situation and it's coming to bite him in the butt. And as a result, he's led to flee from the land of Egypt because the punishment for killing an Egyptian would have been his death. He flees to the land of Midian and he rests at a well. 
Now, you might think that at this point in the story, Moses has had enough. If, if I were him, I probably would have had enough. Because he came from being the prince of Egypt, the epitome of wealth and status of that day. And now he's a man on the run, fleeing for his life with absolutely nothing and despised by his own people. And yet, he maintains the understanding of who he is. Because as another scene of an injustice happens in front of him, he chooses to take action. Our story tells us that the seven daughters of Ruel come up to water their father's flocks at the same well that Moses is resting at. And after they've drawn water, some other shepherds come in and they push them away, essentially stealing the water that they had worked so hard to draw. And then Moses, without making excuse, steps in and saves the day once again. Now, he had every excuse not to get involved. He was tired from his journey. The last two times he had tried to help people, they didn't go so well. He literally had nothing except for his own life to offer. And in reality, he had no social stake or investment in the individuals. They were strangers to him. He probably wouldn't see them again. And yet, it doesn't matter to Moses who is being wronged. What matters is that justice is served. As a society, I think this is a, an, a concept and an understanding that we enjoy filling our time with. If you look through your options on Amazon Prime or on Disney Plus, you'll, you'll see all these superhero movies and superhero television shows. You could watch days upon days of people seeking to bring in bring justice to the oppressed. If the Bible had superheroes, I believe that Moses would be one. Moses can be defined by one word throughout his entire life, and it is that word, justice. But as we learned in our video earlier today, it's not necessarily a justice that seeks to give punishment for those who do wrong, but it's a justice who seeks to bring redemption and restoration and salvation to those who are oppressed. Like Moses, we too are called to define ourselves by acts of justice. All throughout Scripture, we see God calling His people to be that source of restoration to the world. We find in James 1 that God says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Or in Micah 6, 8, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. As you look at our Christian culture today, sometimes it's hard to see those verses being lived out. I think we as a, as a whole have become somewhat passive in our faith. We forget that there is an act, active action part to the faith that we are called to live out. Paul describes what it means to have a true saving faith with these words. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So often, as sinful people, our sinful nature takes over and we become selfish. We see God as something that we possess. We go through our lives however we want and we know that, oh, I have Jesus in my heart and Jesus will take care of everything. I don't have to put forth any effort. 
But the reality of Paul's words here are hinged on three words that completely transform an understanding of what faith is. Those three words are Jesus is Lord. Because with those three words, we stop being focused on ourselves. We stop living a life of faith that's really just for our own gain, our own salvation when judgment comes. But it becomes an active response to who Jesus is. If we truly confess that Jesus is Lord of our life, it transforms every part of who we are. Suddenly, Instead of living for ourselves, we look after our brother and sister around us. And if we see oppression, we are led to seek justice for those individuals. As James also tells us, faith without action isn't truly faith at all. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith? but does not have works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and well-fed, without giving them the things that are needed for their body, what good is that? And also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, to be clear, I'm not advocating that we achieve salvation through our works. That's definitely not what Scripture tells us. We learn from Scripture that we are saved by grace and faith in Jesus Christ alone. What I am telling you this morning is that that faith, if we truly believe that Jesus is Lord, is going to transform every part of who we are. A day is coming. Jesus actually, it's one of the main things that Jesus talks about, is the day of judgment. And that day is coming when we as God's people will stand before his throne. And it is my prayer that we have been a people of action so that we don't hear these words from Matthew. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry. You gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you didn't welcome me in. Naked and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So my challenge question for you and for me, I've, every time I've spoken, I've given us a, a question to ask ourselves. The question this morning is, how would you define yourself? Is an act of justice, is the pursuit of justice one of, one of the words you would use for that definition? Be honest with yourself. Do you daily pursue justice for others? If I'm honest with myself, and I look at my life over the past month, justice for others isn't something I engage with very often. It's honestly not even something I always think about. So often it's easy just to rationalize away why I need to get involved or to just simply be blind to the injustice that's happening around me. If I'm honest, so often I refuse to help the least of these. It's not that there's not injustice around me for me to engage in. The reality is that there is all kinds of people who are in desperate need of help in our community. There's a lot of ministries that are already engaged in trying to bring justice to the oppressed. A few in our community that we can easily be a part of are Love, Inc. and Hungry for Christ, as they seek to give food and provide for different needs for families that are in financial need and are dealing with affliction because of that. 
or positive options and right to life, as they seek to bring salvation, as they seek to bring redemption into a world that easily throws away life. Or the Holland Rescue Mission. I looked up their website today and I was just amazed by all the different ways that they're engaging in this community to bring about restoration for the oppressed. Or we've got Forgotten Man Ministries that is engaged in the prison trying to bring about restoration for individuals that society has deemed unworthy of even being out in public. Or on a, a more global scale, something that many of us might be involved in, Compassion International gives food and clothing and education and health care to children who without those things, might not even ever see adulthood. Or Kids Hope, who gives mentors to children who are at risk socially and educationally. I could fill our time, I could keep going with other options of ministries that we could be involved in, ways that we can address the injustice that is happening right here locally. But I suppose you probably want to get out before noon today. <laughs> so, the reality is that we have many opportunities to engage in God's call for us to seek out justice. And the question is, will you? So I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning, something that might be a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to give us two minutes of silence to think of our past week. Think of how have I seen oppression happening? What part of this past week needed restoration that I did not provide? Restoration that I was completely blind to even seeing. And then to think about the week ahead and ask ourselves, how can I address that injustice going forward? How can I be God's agent of restoration to the world in which we live? After these two minutes of silence, I'll close this in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is our prayer that you will make us into a people who are truly concerned for others. There is oppression all around us. Help us to see it. Help us to follow Christ's example and care for those who are in need. We pray for those who are without food and shelter and other basic needs. We pray for those who are being oppressed in situations of abuse. We pray for those around the world who are without basic freedoms of life. We pray for those who are being oppressed. And we ask that you will lead us to go beyond just saying, go be warm and well-fed, 
but into using the resources you have given us to providing restoration to a world in need. As we go from this place, help us to see the injustice. Give us the courage and the will to step in and to bring your redemption to the world. It is the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Oops, sorry. We have the opportunity now to respond to God's call on our lives, to proclaim through song that we will go to seek those who are in oppression and to redeem them, to bring them out so that they can live life to the fullest. Let's stand and sing. One, two, three, four.
after our last song, I remind you that uh, you can take a seat and the ushers will dismiss you by rows starting from the back. And then you are encouraged to congregate outside. He has shown you, O man, what is good. But what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We go from this place seeking to be God's ambassadors of justice to the world around us. So go with his blessing, grace, mercy, and peace, because the Lord blesses you and keeps you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you. He turns his face towards you. He is gracious toward you, and he gives you his peace so that you can give it to others. One, two, three, four.